My name is Andy Jones. I'm the CEO of Ramsey here in the UK. Ramsey Healthcare is a global provider of healthcare. We operate in 11 countries, employing 77,000 staff. And incredibly, we look after over 8 million patients a year. Ramsey Healthcare has been here in the UK for the last 12 years. We've now become the number one provider for NHS services, which means that GPs are able to choose Ramsey Hospitals to refer their patients for high quality healthcare. So Ramsey has got a long-standing set of values called the Ramsey Way. They really define who we are as an organisation, how we work together, how we look after patients, and ultimately it's all about people caring for people. We're very proud of the services that we provide, and that's largely due to teamwork and our staff. The difference that this makes for patients is really high quality healthcare in all of our hospitals and facilities. We've got an absolutely fantastic programme called Speaking Up for Safety. It's all about training staff to be positive and to call out episodes in patients' care, particularly when they're concerned that things aren't going right. We've been able to grab this program and we're the first organisation in the UK to roll this program out. The future for Ramsey Healthcare is bright both globally and for us here in the UK. All of our units are accredited for endoscopy. The Care Quality Commission has rated 92% of our hospitals as good and 95% of our patients would recommend us to their friends and family. We're a leader in day case surgery. We've looked at the way that our hospitals are designed so that we can treat ever more patients in today's healthcare. The future of healthcare is all about partnerships and integrating the patient journey. At Ramsey, this means we need to be working very closely with all our partners, including the NHS, to make sure that our services are available in all the communities that our hospitals serve. Over time, I can see the company both growing and expanding in the reach of its services. But for me, most of all, patient safety and quality come first. Simply put, people caring for people. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this evening's BOFAS Lecture of Distinction in our Series 2. Uh, tonight, our focus returns to the diabetic foot and uh, very appropriately in, in the problems that we're seeing nowadays. So a few housekeeping things as usual. Um, if you could ask questions using the Q&A icon at the bottom of the Zoom screen, I'll then put these to our speaker uh, later on in the talk. Um, there will be some case-based discussions that we'll be going through as well. The feedback code for tonight's lecture will be put into the chat function at about half an hour, 45 minutes, something like that. Um, but also at the end of the session, a QR code will appear on the screen that can be taken a photograph of and take you through to the feedback. Please do give that feedback. A, it helps us give the lectures in better and better in the future, but also then that is the key to them receiving your certificate and accreditation for Royal College of Surgeon points. So, Without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome this evening's speaker, and that is Miss Verity Curl. Miss Verity Curl is a consultant at the Bedford Hospital NHS Trust, working out of Luton Hospital. She's been a consultant there for over five years. She's a leader and founder of the Diabetic Foot Service in that hospital, and has been both taught um, through BOFAS and at the um, Association of Diabetic Foot Surgeons in the King's course. So is really well placed to give a, a leading speech tonight on the diabetic foot. So without further ado, I'd like to very much welcome Miss Verity Carroll. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, thank you very much, Tim. I better live up to that um, uh, the great introduction. I will uh, share my screen now and let's get on with things. Okay, so acute diabetic foot problems. Um, just an overview of what I'm going to uh, talk about in the next 20 minutes or so. An idea of, this, of the problem, the size of it, and the importance of it. Um, how diabetic foot services in this country should be organized. Uh, basic pathophysiology, assessment of acute diabetic foot problems, 
ulcer management and a bit about Sharko as the main differential at the end. And then we'll uh, go on to some cases. So the problem, um, there's a cumulative a lifetime risk of foot ulcers in diabetes up to 25%. Foot complications account for up to 25% of all admissions for diabetes, both here and in the US. 85% of amputations are preceded by an ulcer. And major amputations have a 50 to 70% five-year mortality. But 80% of those are avoidable. The risk of death is almost double in patients with foot ulcers compared to other diabetics. So why does, uh, so how can we try and uh, help with this? Diabetic foot services should be uh, arranged according to NICE guidance. And also there's a, a joint uh, statement um, from BOA, both FAST, British Vascular Society, Diabetes UK and several others, um, published in April 2016 on the subject. Um, this, uh, these both advise a foot screening service, um, which is generally um, given by the community podiatrists, along with uh, help from the GPs and uh, practice nurses in advising uh, patients how to screen their own feet. A foot protection service is delivered in hospitals, um, and this is for uh, foot ulcers, minor deformities, identification of vascular problems, and is generally delivered by diabetologists and podiatrists. That into the multidisciplinary foot service. This uh, combines a limb saving vascular service with an orthopedic foot reconstruction service and generally involves a large multidisciplinary care team. And as is uh, uh, customary in these talks, this is a, a photo of my own team, slightly blurred, can't remember who took, who took the photo, but uh, I'll, I'll fire them as photographer. This is uh, my vascular surgery colleague. This is a vascular specialist nurse. Uh, next, we have uh, one of the podiatrists, uh, one of the diabetes nurses, myself and our um, professor of uh, diabetes and endocrinology. Um, so on to some basic pathophysiology. Why, why does this happen in the first place? Vasculopathy happens because of uh, thickened capillary basement membranes and arteriolar endothelial proliferation, which causes atherosclerosis of large and medium sized arteries. This in turn causes uh, nephropathy, cardiac issues and retinopathy. Neuropathy is a multifactorial process. Um, the important uh, process is being vascular uh, disease with endothelial dysfunction and alteration of myelin synthesis, giving glycosylation of nerve cell proteins. Um, immunity, as we all know, is affected, and this is largely due to increased T, T lymphocyte apoptosis, which then inhibits healing. Um, so, um, you've got your acute diabetic foot. The first, uh, the first problem is how do, you know, where do they go? Um, they usually present to ED, sometimes they come through our clinic, um, and they should be admitted under physicians. These are patients similar in some ways to neck and femur fractures. So they have a host of medical problems. Um, they're often on a knife edge, and they really should be looked after by people who know how to do so uh, better than orthopedic surgeons. Um, they should have a, an assessment by the uh, member of the MDT team a, as soon as possible. And this should be within 24 hours, which can be somewhat challenging if they present over a weekend. Um, they need surgical input to deprive them as soon as possible, um, particularly if the patient is acutely unwell. Um, and this uh, traditionally has been by vascular surgeons, but now with the, um, the hope, hub and spoke model is here to stay, uh, increasingly orthopedic surgeons need to be involved to do um, at least the initial debridement. Um, debridement should not be delayed for uh, vascular input unless the limb is obviously um, more ischemic than it is infected. So this means particularly if you're in a spoke um, then it means get on with the debridement and ask the vascular surgeons for help in assessing the patient afterwards. So on to the standard stuff, history, you should try and work out if there is an underlying cause of this to try and avoid it happening again. The time scale involved, it's not uncommon for patients to either not present because they don't think there's a major problem because it's not painful, um, or they presented to primary care and, and somebody there has been giving them oral antibiotics in paediatric doses for two or three weeks before um, it becomes obvious that this isn't enough. Um, generally, you should uh, try and ask about their diabetes control, um, diabetes complications, and then other comorbidities, particularly those which might affect um, uh, their, their anaesthetic risks. General examination, obviously you need to know whether the patient is generally well or not. Um, if there is an ulcer, the site and size, surrounding cellulitis, collections, look at the general shape of the foot. And if there isn't an ulcer present, think Charcot. Um, I'll go on to neurovascular status in more detail. So 
um, examining for neuropathy. You need to check for the large myelinated fibers, which generally speaking um, in ED is going to be um, light touch. Make sure that you uh, the patient shuts their eyes. They're very good at confabulating this. In uh, diabetes, diabetic foot clinics, um, you should be able to find a semis Feinstein monofilament um, and a tuning fork if you're lucky, a proprietary device to test vibration. The small fibers pet for pain and temperature, that you should be able to find one of those um, pinprick devices um, in ED. Um, temperature's a bit harder unless you've got an ice cube machine somewhere handy. I don't suggest chucking hot coffee over them. Um, vasculopathy, um, everybody should be able to make a stab at uh, um, checking for pulses, and there should be a handheld doctor in every emergency department. Um, not just to find the pulses if you're struggling to palpate them, but also um, you should try and uh, ascertain whether they are triphasic, biphasic or monophasic. This can take a little bit of um, a practice, um, but it's perfectly possible to do. And if you're able to ankle or toe break your pressure indices. And again, looking for Charcot, uh, temperature difference, we'll go on to this in more later, crepitus, stability or lack of, and obvious deformity in the absence of any uh, significant skin breaches um, really points you towards Charcot rather than um, uh, acute infection, although it's perfectly possible to have both at once. Um, so investigations, hopefully the physicians will uh, have organized the basic bloods um, on admission, but you will have to push them to include clotting and groups and saves as per your local uh, hospital policy, as they're not used to patients going to theatre, so they don't take them routinely. Um, it is worth looking at previous uh, micro results for the patient um, as if they have uh, MRSA, VRE or any of the other superbug uh, superbugs, you may wish to initially cover um, for these before you get the current, uh, the growth from the current samples. And of course, most theatres are going to want to know whether the patient has any of those to um, arrange their services accordingly. Um, looking at imaging, as we all know, x-rays don't show acute osteomyelitis at least for 10 to 14 days. They may show gas in the tissues, which could be relevant. Um, uh, have a chat with your uh, radiologist about whether to include gadolinium in your MRIs. Spec CT may be helpful in um, determining whether this is infection or Charcot, and I'll talk a bit more about Spec CT a bit, a bit later on. Um, and uh, for vascular, again, um, if you're working closely with your vascular colleagues, they will probably have a preference as to which of these. Just a note to say that a lot of these patients, whether um, acutely or chronically, um, do have renal dysfunction. And if you give them um, gadolinium with the MRI, as well as contrast with for the um, vascular studies, then you just have to be a little careful and you don't make their kidneys even worse. So, um, plain x-ray, obviously, hopefully you can see medially that there's a dressing, which indicates the presence of an ulcer, and there is um, some loss of definition of the cortex, um, and some possibly some osteolysis, which suggests that there is some um, osteomyelitis in the metatarsal head. Um, MRI scan, it's fairly obvious looking at this one, um, where, where there are ulcers. Sometimes it's not so obvious and a plea from the um, our radiology colleagues is to be as accurate and as detailed as you can about uh, this site of the ulcers as it makes their job a lot easier in coming to a diagnosis. Generally speaking, if there's edema away from an ulcer, um, it is less likely to be osteomyelitis, not 100% true. Um, so, going on to how we deal with these. So if you're the person that's uh, that's uh, tasked with debriding this, how do you do it properly? I learned the traffic light system at King's uh, where you uh, initially remove the clearly infected necrotic tissue. Then you uh, look for the amber zone, which is inflamed tissue, remove all of that. And then you need to be going in to the green um, zone, which is healthy, normal, normal vascular tissue. Uh, and that is how you, uh, you need to leave um, the foot once you finish debriding it, as you can see in the uh, bottom right photo. Um, the surgical technique I use is uh, having a tourniquet on, but only inflating it if there's excessive bleeding. And sometimes vas my vascular colleagues will tell me not to, not to even do it then, which is slightly alarming. Once through the skin, you can use diathermy to cut, which will reduce blood loss. 
more is more for debridement, or as one of the plastic surgeons at King says, debridement is the perfect crime. If you have removed it and put it in a bucket, it is by definition dead tissue, and nobody can prove it wasn't dead when you removed it. Um, on a more serious note, um, it's a bit different to debriding for diabetic foot infections and say for a um, tibia, open tibial fracture. If um, there is iffy tissue, which you're not, which you, you think you might give a go, don't um, debride it. Otherwise the patient won't improve and they will need to go back to theater. If the neuro neurovascular bundles and tendons are non-viral, remove them for the same reasons. They're, once they're dead, they're dead and they won't get any less dead if you leave them in. Um, take several samples of both bone and soft tissue for microbiology, as you would in any um, infected uh, circumstances, um, and try and take deep um, samples as ones that have already been exposed to the air, potentially in a chronic ulcer, are going to have mixed growth and muddy the waters potentially. Bone can and probably should be removed segmentally. Um, MRI scans can be a bit misleading. You don't need to remove everything that lights up on an MRI scan. Um, uh, you need to, you can take away the soft, um, mushy bone, um, but anything that's macroscopically normal um, can generally be left because um, any remaining osteomyelitis um, will be mopped up by the antibiotics uh, as long as the blood supply is adequate. If you've used a tourniquet, release it and make sure you obtain hemostasis. Um, as I've said, these patients should be on a medical ward and the nurses there aren't as used to um, a bit of oozing through dressings and tend to panic at three o'clock in the morning if they see any blood. Um, lots of wash, as again, I'm sure you would in any infected situation. I tend to use peroxide and saline and then uh, wash, the, wash the peroxide out of the wound with more saline alone. Um, I use Jelinek gauze, velvet band and crepe over the back slab if there's instability, particularly in the mid and hind foot. Um, discuss with your local TVNs um, uh, what they prefer, prefer you to use. Um, I don't use a, a vac dressing straight away, um, largely because um, this is quite inflamed tissue. You've done a big debridement. It can be quite friable. And these patients are also often on anti um, platelet drugs. So if you put a vac dressing on straight away, they tend to lose quite a lot of their blood volume into it, which isn't ideal. It's generally easy for the podiatrist to put them on the ward because most of them are um, neuropathic and so it's not painful. Local antibiotic delivery, I think Tim um, mentioned that a little earlier. Um, it, this is a bit of a game changer. Um, it's uh, antibiotic in, in a carrier, obviously. It provides high concentration of tissues and low in the blood, so you can use things like vancomycin and gentamicin um, without causing any further damage to kidneys. It potentially has the use of uh, less systemic antibiotics, oral versus IV or reduced time period, although this is uh, still um, uh, uh, out, um, still the jury's out on this at the moment. Um, I tend to use either Stimulan for soft tissues or Ceramant for bone. Stimulan is calcium sulfate and it can be mixed with pretty much any antibiotic. Um, it comes uh, in the package with a, uh, a helpful sort of recipe for most of the common antibiotics. Um, and Ceramant uh, has calcium hydroxyapatite as well as the sulfate, so um, can um, hopefully um, allow bone, uh, bony ingrowth, um, but only comes with vancomycin or gentamicin. Um, so this is Stimulan. Um, the scrub nurses usually like uh, using this. It's quite good fun for them to uh, put the um, paste into the little ice cream, uh, sorry, ice cube uh, holder and um, then uh, pop the little ice cubes of uh, Stimulan out again. And you can see them there in a slightly blurred picture in the wound. Worth um, noting that if uh, it's not used commonly, the, the people who are dressing the wound should be informed because I've heard had people on the phone telling me there's pus or maggots in the wound. Uh, so that can be cause some alarm. Um, this is Ceramant. The Ceramant being used in a um, calcanium, which was largely macroscopically normal. So uh, this is a silo technique where you drill multiple holes um, and then uh, use, it, use suction to dry the bone as much as possible while you're introducing the uh, fairly liquid um, cerement. And as you can see on the left, there are multiple drill holes and there's still a suction device in there. And uh, that on the right is what it tends to look like. Um, that looks slightly gray, normally a bit whiter than that. So a few tips and tricks, elliptical wounds generally seem to heal faster. Be prepared to extend along tendons or pus highways as they're known in the diabetic foot world. Chamfer bone cuts, don't leave any sharp edges to cause further ulcers once you've spent a long time getting this current one um, uh, healed. Preserve the fifth metatarsal base almost at all costs. 
perineus brevis function is vitally important. Um, and if uh, this is um, dysfunctioned, um, then they tend to uh, go on a rapid decline with a various hind foot ulceration. And um, uh, almost inevitably, uh, they need a hind foot reconstruction if they're up to it. Um, remove the remaining articular cartilage if you're amputating through joints and leaving open. Um, the lack of blood supply um, doesn't generally uh, allow for granulation tissue to go to grow over the top. Um, if you're closing and you're happy that it's it's chronic infection and the underlying bone is, is normal and uninfected, then you can leave the articular cartilage. Somewhat controversially, k wires may be used to stabilise, and um, this sort of flies in the face of the accepted wisdom that you shouldn't put metal anywhere near infection. But actually, in the diabetic foot world, it's, it's uh, more or less accepted fact. Um, as long as you've done a decent debridement, a decent washout, actually stability is good to get rid of infection. And um, the k wires can generally be fairly easily pulled anyway, um, or even if, even if you use um, threaded ones, you can take them out in theatre without too, much problem, too many problems. Um, so in the medium to long term, uh, we tend, unless we've managed to close them, um, to use a vac until there's granulation tissue at skin level. Um, they can go home if you've got a decent hospital at home service on um, IV antibiotics um, and uh, with the vac. And they may need a bivalve cast, a Darko shoe, um, just to allow them limited mobility. It's very difficult to get them to be to stay on weight bearing. Um, they after that, um, uh, you can use a, a total contact cast until they're healed. It's sometimes worth in the younger, fitter patients where um, you'd like to get them back to normal, back to work um, uh, a bit quicker to uh, consider a split skin graft. Occasionally they'll, they'll do a flap if their blood supply is good. Um, they're going to need referral to orthotics for either insoles, footwear or both. And they may require reconstruction if there's a severe deformity, instability or recurrent ulceration. So Charcot is the main differential if you've got a, an acute diabetic foot problem. Um, it's it's um, a progressive non-infective condition infecting the bones, joints and soft tissues of the foot and ankle characterized by inflammation in the earliest phase. It's caused by neuropathy of any cause. Um, and in fact, the earliest reports, and it's not actually clear whether the Charcot was the first report, were of, uh, of Charcot in patients with neurosyphilis, not uh, diabetic neuropathy. Eichenholz classification uh, is essentially is a classification of the um, natural history of uh, Charcot. Um, Eichenholz in 1966 published three stages and there's a uh, widely used um, uh, modification uh, back in 1990 when it became obvious that um, there were some patients with clinical Charcot, normal x-rays, but um, edema on MRI scan. I won't um, go through all of that, but essentially there's destruction, coalescence and consolidation. And by the time there's consolidation, um, uh, the patient is clinically, um, the, shark, the Charco is clinically settled, although they may well be left with um, deformities. So acute Charco, um, as you can see, a hot, well, you can't see it's hot, but it's a red and uh, swollen foot. Um, and it's almost always painless, not, 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 100% of the time. Um, the patient, I have heard patients say both of these things. Woke up this morning, can't get my foot inside my shoe. Walk along, heard a crack, foot started to swell up. There's quite often a history of sort of some sort of minor something that's gone on. They've twisted their ankle, they've stumbled going down a step, but generally not anything major. Um, examination, as I've said before, they will have a red foot, it will be swollen and it will be warm. The temperature, the accepted temperature difference suggested of Charcot is greater than two degrees. And this is based on work done at, at King's uh, by Prof Edmonds. Um, there may well be deformity by the time they see you. The unfortunately, um, uh, people are generally well aware of infection in diabetic feet, but less well aware of Charcot. Um, so it often is quite a, a, a number of weeks before they're um, correctly diagnosed. Crepitus and instability may be present, but if their foot is very um, hot and uh, swollen, it may be very difficult to actually elicit those signs. So as we said uh, before, x-rays are um, often normal in the very early stages. You may see some soft tissue swelling or a bit of um, bone um, density heterogeneity. Um, so another picture of an acute Charcot foot. Um, this was when they presented to ED, the initial X-ray sent away, nothing wrong. And then 10 days later, you get that. I've had another one who didn't present straight away. One of the ones who was um, doing his um, five mile walk, had a crack, didn't think anything of it because his foot wasn't sore and then presented 
about 10 days down the line with an X-ray similar to that, except for his media cuneiform had actually extruded. Um, the the, the um, medics thought it was an abscess uh, until I pointed out it was bone. Um, so MRI um, will show um, character distribution of um, periarticular marrow edema and also show soft tissue edema as well. So as you can see, this hind foot charcoal on the left, it's not uncommon to see uh, fracture in the um, a calcaneum. I think that one's trying hard to be fractured. And on the right, that's a bit of a mess really, isn't it? I mean, the uh, tail of the vicular joint appears um, uh, dislocated for a start and there's edema in the, in the talus, uh, navicular and whichever cuneiform that is, I think. Um, so spec CT, um, it can, uh, Kings did a lot of work on this when they first got their spec CT scanner. Uh, several years ago, um, they ex they uh, imaged a number of patients with both a SPEC CT and MRI, I think within a week. Um, and these are patients that, that clinically su suspected of Charcot. Um, they found a number of patients where the SPEC CT lit up and the MRI didn't. Uh, but interestingly, all the patients that were negative for SPEC CT, um, none of them went on to de develop Charcot. So it is good with a, a negative predictive value. So treatment. You'll struggle if you see them in ED to do anything other than keep them non-weight bearing uh, and refer. If there's an air cast boot around and they don't have a big deformity, you can try using one of those. If they've got a deformity, don't. I've seen some horrendous ulcers of patients that would have spent only a couple of weeks in an air cast boot with an ulcer, uh, with a big deformity. Total contact cast is a gold standard, but they do need adequate blood supply. You're wrapping them up so their toes uh, aren't seen for at least a week at a time. And almost inevitably, they, they get rubs every now and again, and they need an adequate blood supply for those not to turn into horrendous ulcers worse than the original problem. If you can't manage that, a split cast is generally better than their cast boot because it's made for the patient and their deformity. 90% um, will not deform further after cast application, which is great. Unfortunately, a fair, unless they're already in the system, a lot of patients will be already deformed by the time um, they get their cast. So um, uh, from left to right, you've got a total contact cast, a split cast, and then um, a patient who uh, was one of the ones that um, uh, didn't get to us in time and had that deformity before they went in th into the cast. Long-term management, um, similar to patients with ulcers. Um, uh, they need insoles or specialist footwear where they need education to come back if the shark is uh, uh, recurring or if they develop um, uh, ulcers over, over bony deformity, bony prominences. Um, they may need deformity correction if there's instability and or recurrent ulceration due to deformity. They need to be fit for surgery, which is often four plus hours long. And there's a range of procedures, which um, I won't go into this evening, but there's a couple of cases if we get that far. So I'd like to acknowledge uh, the rest of my um, colleagues in the Luton Dunstable Hospital multidisciplinary foot team. Um, Prof Kavitharpu and Raju Aluwalia from King's, who taught me well and uh, who've contributed uh, one or two of the uh, uh, cases, although ones I was involved with, and uh, Miss Lucy Cooper from Liverpool, who's also uh, contributed some content to the slides. And there we are. I'm, I'm hoping there are some questions. Verity, thank you very much for a tour de force covering the whole of diabetics. Um, there have been a few questions come in. Um, basically, if we want you, I want to try and do is take them back through the, the questions that kind of uh, through the order of your talk. Um, you mentioned at the beginning about the hot foot that's coming in, and, and it, it can sometimes appear like charcoal as well. How do you try and differentiate between an acute hot foot with an ulcer versus something else? It can be very difficult. Um, generally speaking, even in a diabetic, they don't get significant deep infection that swells their whole foot up um, mm -hmm. unless there is some form of skin breach a pre-existing ulcer, um, somebody who stepped on a nail, we've had a couple of those recently, um, somebody with glass in their foot, um, you know, even the podiatrist just taking off a little bit, you know, a bit of callus that's a little bit too deep. So there's usually something there to provoke it. Um, usually they have a temperature, usually their CRP is significantly raised. And with Charcot, that's generally not the case. Although again, it's an inflammatory process and their CRP, can, can be up in a low grade fashion, usually less than 50, but not always. And they usually aren't systemically unwell either. Um, 
I have seen both. I've seen somebody present the, the one I was talking about who went with, you know, effectively a massive Liz Frank problem from normal to that in 10 days. And he had um, a thankfully relatively superficial ulcer um, with a small amount of um, infection, but the cause of it was acute charcot. So we had to treat him for both at the same time. So, yeah. yeah. And if you're seeing that hot red swollen foot, which is always pointing, do you, do you wait to get an MRI scan or get an ultrasound scan before doing something about it? I think if you are not, if you're not convinced, if the patient is well and they're not septic and there is no definite fluctuance there, then I, and there's no ulcer and there's no obvious source of infection, then I would wait to get an MRI before I launched in with a knife. But um, that's usually um, it's, uh, you, no, how can I put this? It, it, it's, a, it's a team decision and it, it does depend on experience. Um, so yes, in a septic patient, then uh, with a pointing abscess, then I would definitely get on with it and cut first and ask questions later. But if there is, if if they if their CRP isn't that high, they're not unwell and there's no obvious source of infection, I would wait and get an urgent MRI scan and an MDT opinion before you start operating. And if it's a, a four foot I've got a question here. If it, if it is a forefoot problem um, yeah. and you're doing that incision and drainage and the toe doesn't look happy, yes. would you take the toe at the time or, or always come back? It's an interesting one. If you're taking a lot of, of the skin of the toe, um, it's going to be difficult to get that to grow back again anyway. If it's if if it's looking duskier and duskier, frankly, you've brought, you've you know the neurovascular bundles are gone anyway. You're probably better taking it then as to waiting and having to take them back the following or somebody has to take them back the following week. Um, so yes, that's experience to an extent, and that probably heads into uh, another point about, you know, crikey, this sounds very complicated. Should I be really be doing this at two o'clock in the morning? Mm -hmm. The answer is, if you've got a septic patient with an abscess, and you know, yes, you do need to be doing it at two o'clock in the morning. You don't necessarily have to do it um, perfectly. If you let the uh, if you let the pus out, you take out away the worst of the necrotic tissue. Um, that will be enough, it should be enough um, with antibiotics to allow the patient to um, become, to, to, to remove their sepsis and then anything else can be tidied up by the MDT afterwards. Um, so when the patient is fitter for an anaesthetic a few days later. Okay, um, and moving through onto the more ulcer part of the talk, um, you mentioned about getting a, a feeling of pulse. Um, do you use ABPIs in diabetics as a, as a good reference? Um, they, I, we tend, again, I've taught at King's and, I, and, and we tend to do, do it the same way at Luton. We tend to go more on, um, whether the, the, the quality of the pulse on a Doppler, whether mm -hmm. it's monophasic, biphasic or triphasic. The problem with ABPIs is that uh, a lot of diabetics have calcified vessels. And so mm -hmm. the ABPI can be falsely raised. I don't tell, I've, I've not got much experience with toe break your um, pressure indices. And I think they are slightly more reliable than ankle ones from what I gather. So we tend to use um, uh, the, the quality of the pulses. If we've got our vascular surgeon or vascular nurse with us and we're quite used to them now, we're happy enough to go with what, um, uh, with with our experience but if we are worried if there's a monophasic pulse or if you you know if you're doing them and you're not used to it um then i'm happy enough with whatever um is is most readily available um and most appropriate but again i stress that um if you've got your your septic patient with a hot red swollen foot and a pointing abscess um and you're struggling to feel pulses it doesn't matter that can be investigated and revascularized after the event if necessary. And, and pulses are funny things. You can get pulses that are palpable, but um, because of all the um, inflammatory cytokines, et cetera, that actually um, increase um, uh, the uh, size of the blood vessels temporarily. And then once you've um, taken away the infection, um, mm. they're pulseless again, and they actually do have an underlying vascular problem. Or either way, you may not be able to find the pulses easy just because they're so swollen and they're there and they're fine. So it's a little bit unreliable in the acutely infected foot. And as I said, um, if they're sick, do what you need to do and ask yeah. vascular afterwards. And then when you're dealing with a kind of cooler foot that presents with an ulcer, there's a question here 
um, about whether you imply any role or grading modalities such as the Wagner grading or the University of Texas grading. Do you use those much? So, um, yeah, I, I have to say we we don't. The podiatrists, um, for audit purposes, tend to do that. Um, it's there, um, but there's so many factors in, in, in and how and when you intervene that I'm not sure they are particularly useful as a uh, clinical tool. Mm. Yes, they are used for audit purposes. The only one I use is occasionally if you can probe down through an ulcer and touch bone, it's generally yes. infected, isn't it? The old Grayson's yeah. paper probe Definitely. the bone. Definitely, and I'm less That's good at the dietary right. are, um, are very good at telling me, oh, you know, the bone feels gristly. Um, and 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 if 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 they tell me that, then I'm pretty sure it's um it's osteomyelitic without an MRI scan. And and often they will proudly present you a little piece of bone that they've removed. <laughs> so that's <laughs> yeah, you don't need a scan for that. <laughs> what what do, any thoughts on the, the views coming out of the discussion at the moment on operating in the hot charcoal or casting and waiting for the cold charcoal? That's an interesting one. And um the chap I was, you know, referring to the chap that I that I mentioned earlier with the extruded um, uh, medium can air form. So I had an opportunity. There was a sort of Zoom meeting with um, uh, some of the uh, diabetic foot uh, gurus, including uh, Venu from Kings, and we had a bit of a chat about what we should do about him and when to intervene. It's still controversial to an extent. Um, as I said, he did have some infection, so that was debrided and. Um, healed relatively quickly which was excellent so and, and and generally he had a very even though his skin actually the infection was underneath um and the skin on the medial aspect whereas cuneiform was tenting it actually never really looked threatened but on the whole we sort of decided that um his foot would be happier um without his cuneiform so i did actually go in relatively early and remove the cuneiform which and his foot seemed relatively stable at that point so um at that point um then it suggested we we tcc him and wait until the temperature went below two degrees which took a while and actually he's had a ct and mri i'm just waiting to see him back in clinic again but that's several months down the line now and his foot seems to have settled so i'm not sure i'm necessarily going to proceed with um reconstruction now but we'll see you mentioned there about tcc just for the just for the register of veins what's what is the core difference between a tcc and a normal cast so a TCC is a total contact cast. Um, they, the minimum of padding that safe is used so that um, you get the least amount of shear force um, on the skin. Um, it, it, they pad the areas that need to be padded rather than ev everywhere, although there is a, a thin layer. Um, and the idea is that the less shear force there is on the soft tissue than the skin, um, the uh, more likely you are to get healing. And you, you can have in, in, in non-infected um, ulcers, um, you can get some spectacular results from a few weeks in a TCC ulcers that have been uh, uh, there for two years. We had, had one recently that even I wasn't convinced. I debrided it, make sure it wasn't infected and it undermined quite a bit even after I debrided it. And um, the nurses were, and, and the, and the plaster techs were uh, um, very proud of themselves when after about five or six weeks, it obviously suddenly started to get smaller. And over the space of about, I don't know, three or four months, um, healed completely. Um, so, so yes, but it is important. Again, as you saw the pictures, the toes are um, hidden. So nerve, mm -hmm. you can see if they're turning black. The patients, most of these patients can't feel anything. So if the cast is rubbing them or whatever, they can't, you know, there will be an ulcer. Um, and uh, so you have to supervise them closely. And if a patient is unreliable or doesn't want to turn up every week to begin with, then it probably isn't, it isn't a very good treatment. It'll do more harm than good, cause more ulcers. And in your radical debridements you showed where you were using local cement uh, or impregnated um, beads locally. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions here. One, if, you, if it's not possible to have access to the stimulant and sterement, can you use antibiotic loaded um, PMMA cement and then remove it later on? Um, potentially you could do. Obviously there's the downside that it um, uh, tends to cook the bone a bit because it is um, an exothermic reaction, whereas neither the stimulant nor the uh, cement is mm -hmm. um, significantly. Um, but yes, it may be. And it's also the downside of that is that the elution is um, a bit is less predictable. So mm -hmm. these are studied and they uh, elute um, a more predictable amount of um, antibiotic um, over 
a more defined period of time. Um, the problem with cement, it tends a lot at the beginning and then it tails off and whatever. Um, so it's not quite as good. If you didn't have anything else, uh, we've used Gentacol once or twice. My colleagues are happy using that if they're doing the ripen. So um, that's that's another option. And with the stimulant and the cement, for those who don't know, do you leave it in, take it out? Do you wash it through? What do you um, do? It, it all dissolves. So um, you uh, leave it there and it will dissolve. Calcium sulfate will dissolve and calcium hydroxyapatite, as we know, is perfectly safe to, to leave in bone. Um, and um, yeah, they do. You can use VAC with them. Um, they do tend to, um, they can be a bit wet. And if you use them, then close the wound. Sometimes you see some white stuff coming out. So again, people think it's pus when it isn't. Um, but yes, it's, they're, they're good. They're good things. And stimulant's not particularly expensive. Ceramen is, but it, it's better than having just a long stay in hospital. It's about, you know, 1500 pounds for five mil, for 10 mils ish, um, five well, mils. There's a question here about whether um, whether you decide to use Ceramen B or Ceramen G. Hmm. Do you have a, a microbiologist as part of your MDT, so to speak? And the... So we have a microbiology pharmacist that we that we uh, use um, who, who comes around with us on ward rounds and generally, because he sees the patient, um, understands how we work a bit more than the consultant microbiologists. Um, but in answer to the question, actually, I tend to go with, with an Oxford study, with what Oxford tend to do, or at least did the last time I heard them talk, which is... Um, they tend to go for G as it's got um, a wider, a broader spectrum of, um, of coverage. And um, it also helps because a lot, a lot of the time, certainly the four foot stuff, it, um, G comes in five mils, whereas um, the V doesn't, comes in 10 mils. And uh, it, it often, unless you know they're definitely MRSA and there's nothing else going on, um, because it's all to do with the, the, the high concentrations. So antibiotic resistant is generally relative. It's mm -hmm. the fact that it's you can't you need it in certain uh, levels, certain concentrations to kill the bugs. And the problem with things with both vancomycin and gentamicin is, is in, in a lot of patients, if you get that, if there is resistance to either of those two, um, you would kill the patient's kidneys before you got a high enough level where you needed it, i.e. in the foot. Whereas if you get it locally and they've done all the they've done all the um, the tests for this, you can get a, a, a hugely high concentration locally, which is way above um, the concentration needed to kill the bugs, even in a relatively resistant organism. But you still get very little in the bloodstream in systemically, and so the kidneys are perfectly safe. And will you use a back type dressing over the top of beads like that? Yeah, I mean, we, we have done. And again, you know, there's been debate about this. Does it actually suck some of it out and make it less um, less effective? Probably a bit. But the combination and with the VAC helping with taking any um, any further infection away and promoting the um, wound healing with granulation tissue, I think is in general is worth is worth it. But it's yeah, it's a little bit of a, um, a risk versus benefit situation. Well, these questions that are coming in. It's fantastic. Well, I think I know you've got some really good cases that are going to bring out these points and reiterate what you've been talking about. So if, you, if you've got a moment, would you want to share yes. your screen and we could go I through some do. of those? I should go back to there we go. Right place. So case number one, this is the most recent mm -hmm. one I've done as it happens. So um, you can just about see the problem. You know, I said about people standing on nails. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and again, I think he went to his GP, got some antibiotics and his foot got worse over the space of a couple of weeks, I think. So pitched up looking like this, as you can probably see, there's a he's in jeans. So this isn't theatre. This is the podiatrists. And um, they sent me this. I hadn't actually seen this patient. He got he got referred to them through, I think, community podiatry. And um, I said, yeah, he needs to go to theatre. Um, and so uh, that was a when that was a Tuesday, I think Tuesday, Wednesday, and, and um, he got he got admitted, and I took him to theatre on the Friday, and it looked similar, probably a little bit more erythematous, and um, I have a good scrub staff, and I had a, a, a middle grade with a registrar with me, trainee in fact, who had never seen me do one of these before. Um, in fact, I think he'd seen one diabetic foot debridement before. Had been hearing me bang on about using ankle tourniquets for um, anything dist, uh, test, tarsal joints and distal. So I put the ankle tourniquet on. And the scrub took me aside and said, Miss Carroll, 
I think you, you just think that, that 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 looks a bit red, a bit further up, and do you want the tourniquet on the thigh instead? So I said, good point, yes, please. Um, because he's seen me do some of these before. And um we ended up doing that. Gosh, so it's tracked up, there's tracks, isn't it? Yeah. Tracked up um a tip post, but we ended up I you can't you, I, we never took a, a, a proper photo of the sole, but you can just see a little bit there. And we've actually it's actually tracked across the sole, and um FHL was sort of stuck in the middle of this as well. So we removed his sesamoids and re removed FHL as well. So once again, you've gone beyond that run or beyond that red zone. Yeah. And you've excised the amber zone, haven't you? Yeah. Exactly, and into green. I mean, you can, as you can see, this is all bleeding now. Admittedly, this is no tourniquet up. It was on, but not up. And mm -hmm. as I said to the registrar, if that was his foot and I did this to it, I'd be expect expecting the nurses to hand me a mop and bucket so I could I could clean the floor afterwards. This um, pulled a bit on the drapes, but really didn't get much on the floor at all. So we're a bit worried about his blood supply. Um, and as you can see, we just started to put the stimulant in and then I'm, I thought, oh, yeah, better take a photo of this. So we scooped some of it back out again before um, before putting some more in uh, before mm. we uh, before we dressed it. Um, so that is um, uh, that was actually last week. This week um, his so his CRP was 260, I think, pre-op. Yeah. Um, by the that on the Friday, by the Monday it was down to 120 something, and by the Wednesday it was down to about 70, I think 90, 70 something like that. Um, oh, really? Unfortunately, it's gone down to about 60 and stopped, and he appears to have a chest infection. Okay. So we we are as as you can see, there's a little bit of sort of ongoing slough there, not terrible. This toe's a little bit dusky. But a week later, it's actually looking all right. So mm. we do need an MRA. And he was supposed to have one last week because he wasn't very well. He hasn't had that yet. But, so the radical debridement really made a massive difference. And you took lots of deep samples trying to avoid yes. the skin. Is that right? Exactly. Um, and they've grown some, I can't remember what, but they've grown some interesting bugs. So, and you, so you put him in the, uh, you put in the stimulant beads and then what, yes. IV antibiotics as well? IV antibiotics as well in his particular case. His, his, yeah. um, his CRP is so high. But I've I've really chopped out all the um all the infected bone as far as I can tell. His mm -hmm. first metatarsal there is um is visible. So mm -hmm. we're gonna put a vac dressing on now and sit tight while his chest recovers. Yep. Um, get the vascular studies. Um, and if his blood supply is okay, then he's actually a fairly young fit bloke. Admittedly, his, his HBA one C is 130, I think. Um, but I might offer him up to the vascular to the plastic surgeons to see if they fancy doing something to get this healed a bit more quickly. Because um, okay. we'll struggle probably with the amount of bone I've left for this to heal without some form of. Uh, do you? I mean, basically, if you were worried about any of the skin edges, would you have any worries about going back to theatre and doing more debridement? No, um, I have to say now, I about ninety percent of mine are okay on the first debridement, but mm. I've been doing it for a while, so I should they should be. Um, but yes, every now and again, uh, we take them back. If we have ones worse than this, we just caught this in time. We left it another few days to a week I'd have had to do what the scrub nurse has seen me do on several occasions and there are one or two other cases that we end up unzipping them right the way up here and there's mm -hmm. infection um, in the muscles etc and mm -hmm. so those ones I plan to take back to theatre after a week just to wash them out again and stick some more stimulant in etc um, I can I'm, I'm usually fairly good at judging these days which ones I'm going to come back and which ones won't but yes yeah, sometimes they're unexpected um, as when I did similar to this sort of all turn black after a few days afterwards. So we rushed through his, his MRA and actually he went off to our hub, a vascular hub yep. to have an angioplasty. And then he came back down and it's, it wasn't worth debriding him again until he got a good blood supply. Um, the skin so, infection is settled. We got that sorted and then did a first, first ray amputation on, on him. So yeah. So, so in essence, the drainage of the pus is the emergency bit. Absolutely. And then if you can, debride what you safely can, but don't worry about it if you're not a specialist. If you're not a specialist, do what again, you don't do. Yeah, somebody can mm -hmm. come back again. And, mm -hmm. and it's safer. Again, I can do this quickly because I've done it enough times now. I'm mm -hmm. confident enough I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I can do a big debridement quickly. Um, mm -hmm. 
which which is obviously important you, you know at three o'clock in the morning when the patient's septic the anesthetists aren't going to thank you for spending hours of riding a patient um in fact they'll probably stop you doing it so yes do what do what you can safely do with with the patient's stick and anesthetically potentially unstable and then i can come back or your local um diabetic foot surgeon whether vascular mm -hmm. or, or orthopedic mm -hmm. can come back and tidy the rest up when the patient is you know their crps come down um their blood pressure stabilized their kidneys are better Fantastic. Okay, good case, good case. So the next one is, this is one from King's, although one I did. Um, so, you know, this is a more, this is one where you can kind of see, actually, this one wasn't done quite so acutely. It's more distal. The patient, it's, it's relatively localised. The patient wasn't particularly septic, so he'd been in on IV antibiotics. And that's largely settled the cellulitis. So you're left with what to do about this ulcer which again from experience and also the um podiatrist sticking one of their probes down goes straight into the M the first mtp joint mm -hmm. i think we've got an mri scan confirming the above um so um i debrided in an ellipse as i said um sort of the first layer and you could see again that this is sort of capsule and it's going through the capsule so had to go into the joint and as I don't know how it projects, but that is, um, I've taken off half a centimeter or so of the um, proximal phalanx there. So the articular cartilage is gone and a chamfer cut to the metatarsal, probably just below the neck, I think. And do you apply the same kind of principle of green, amber, red to the bone as well? Um, pretty much, yes. I mean, if it's of normal qual macroscopic quality and it's bleeding normally, I will leave it at that point. If it's um, mushy, or it's not bleeding, then I will take further. As I said, it's perfectly reasonable to do that segmentally. The other issue is you also want, if possible, the bone to be below the soft tissue, because that way it'll granulate quite happily. There's no point in having bone sticking out above the soft tissue, it's never gonna heal anyway. Um, so you might as well resect it back. So as you can see, there's a quite a large gap. And this patient at this point was relatively fit. Um, so I decided to, and the, but the toe looked fine. So I didn't really want to amputate right down here. So, but equally this potentially was going to be a bit flail and a bit floppy if um, I didn't do something else. So I mentioned K wires, got a long K wire and stuck mm -hmm. it right down through the middle. Okay. Um, okay. And then um, left it. This is about six weeks, as you can tell, because the wire's still in. Um, I don't think we, ha I don't think I put any local antibiotics in. I probably would put some Simulan in now. Um, I may have done. Um, and um, anti and antibiotics. Um, if you're leaving, if you're leaving metal work in, you certainly need systemic antibiotics. I think um, I can't remember if we gave them IVs or orals um, in the end for the whole six weeks. As you can see. That's healing. It does at this point. It's still it's still deep, and there's still a small bit that goes through to that wire. So we're all thinking, well, should work. And then that, in fact, that's a six week one because it's still got the still got the wire in there. So that's a six weeks. You can see all this is new epithelializing tissue. That's where the extent of the wound was. So your um, principle is to, superficial now. Your principle is to clear the zone of infection. Yep. and get back to good healthy tissue and then exactly. stabilize as best you can to help the healing tissues is that right and yep yeah, and you can stabilize it in a number of ways as i said it's uh, it seems it's uh, somewhat counterintuitive to what to use wires but they are used a lot to, in toes and also in the midfoot you can use wires i've even seen them used in the hind foot although if you're getting that far up you can potentially use an x fix instead if, if the hind foot's involved um if you've got uh, somebody um uh that has frame expertise you can use frames um or if you're struggling with it, with any of that, uh, put them in a cast. It's better than nothing. It still provides stability. And having done it, are you closing these wounds or are you using second intention granulation healing? So most, it, it depends on the circumstances. If I'm getting somebody with a sort of chronic, uh, more chronic sort of sinus, um, mm. and actually most of it's settled, they've got grumbling osteomyelitis, then quite often if I'm either amputating or doing this, then the soft tissues have largely sorted themselves out and it's more the bone you're dealing with, then yes, I'll close them, potentially over some, um, over some stimulan um, or, or cerement. If they're acute and the soft tissues are, need debriding, they need debriding. Um, it, different people have, di have different views. King, certainly when I got there, rarely closed anybody. Oxford tends to take people back to theatre until they can close them. 
and I tend to do a bit of both. You know, I'll, I'll close them where I can reasonably close them. Usually, as I said, in, more, in the more chronic cases. Um, but if they they need a big hole, they heal. As you can see, that's a, that's a six weeks after that big hole. I don't have a photo of him healed because unfortunately, he then had a stroke, and we kind of lost him to follow up. Okay. Okay. Which again, unfortunately, is it happens with these patients. As I said, the last one I debrided, he's now got a chest infection. Um, but you know, you 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 deal with what you've got, and you know, unfortunately, you don't win them all. Um, so that's and that's the X-ray without the wiring. So you can see he's actually kept a straight. That that this is all sort of scar tissue, and um, yeah, it's a bit floppy. It you know his tendons don't work, but um, it looks like a toe, and it's a shearable foot. So. That's what you're trying to achieve. It does sound like what you're, you're saying again is if you've got a vascular supply, you've got a foot that's worth salvaging, you don't have to go straight to amputation. No, absolutely. You can not. be radical with your debridement. Yes. And then now like, second intention type healing or occasionally primary closure, but with good antibiotic cover. Yes. Locally, plus occasionally IV or plus yes. IV and parenteral antibiotics as well. Uh, but you've got to get stability. Yes, right? so you've got yeah. to get rid of infection and get stability. And then the antibiotics will, it's, it's yeah. almost another way of thinking of it. It's a bit like um, cancer surgery. Mm -hmm. You get the whole of the tumour and have clear margins. So that's, yeah. the, that's the radical debridement. Yeah. Um, and then you need your chemotherapy afterwards. Brilliant. Great case. Great case. Um, so this one's another Luton one. This is how he presented. So a um, hot, dusky foot, isn't it? Exactly. A bit dusky. Um, you're worried about this toe because it does look a little bit on the, you know, trying to be necrotic side already. And um, so, again, I think that was that there. That's a bed end. That was that was an inpatient. And as you can see, his cellulitis was continuing to spread around the around the mark that mm. even the medics are used to doing this now for us. Um, and so debridement, again, was quite radical. Oh, you've taken the toe. Yeah, so the toe, the toe went. By the time I debrided the back to normal tissue, normal soft tissue, I'd more or less skeletalized the toe. So that was never going to survive. Remove that. Again, it was going into the other this toe. So I but that looked viable otherwise. So I gave that a chance. These are not flex attendants, sorry, extensor tendons. These are metatarsals. Okay. That's a tendon, I think, in there somewhere. But the second, third, fourth, and I've again you can see I've actually um, amputated that. So the metahead's gone in the bin with the toe, but these are all still attached. And um, again, it can be difficult to get granulation tissue over bone without periosteum. Um, plastic surgeon certainly won't graft over bone without periosteum, but I've learned a couple of tricks over the years. So I tend to um, score this with a saw blade and just try and get some bleeding onto the top. And the patient um, now, I think I seem to remember he did need some vascular revascularization. And um, I'd said to him at this stage, I said, you know, I gave it a go, but I said, look, I think we're probably going to have to do a transmetatarsal amputation and use the planter skin, which was okay to flap over to close this. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he didn't like that idea very much and sort of <laughs> went away. Um, and I sort of got to this stage. I said, actually, you know what? Plastics might just be able to graft over that. It'll, it'll get better quicker. But he didn't like, he, he, he had enough and he, he went away and the district nurses dressed this and that happened. Gosh. Okay. So, so just diabetics don't heal. Do intention they? healing. Yeah. They do heal. It takes mm -hmm. time. They heal if you leave them long enough and you've got a good blood supply and mm -hmm. you've got rid of the infection with a decent debridement. He, and literally he had one debridement. The, oops, wrong way. He had one debridement. Mm -hmm to that and then the rest was all he may have had maggots somewhere along the line once um but the healing with a hot foot can session. really save a foot and save a life can't it yeah well you know I, as i said that wasn't a made-up statistic the yeah. um mortality uh or the the, the mortality rate five-year yeah. mortality rate is 50 to 70 percent probably edging nearer 50 now uh given we have got more mdts and more people who know what they're doing with these um, and, and, and also the, um, the diabetes uh, care is hopefully improving a bit. Um, but even 50% mortality, that's uh, five years. That is worse than a lot of forms of cancer. And people are out there making awareness of cancer, raising money for cancer, trying to get better cancer treatments. And as many, you know, uh, lots of people get cancer, but lots of people are diabetic as well. 
you know, okay. and, and that's probably what got, what got what got me my job. I, I as we all do, you mostly do have to do a presentation when you you have your consultant interviews, and I put up that slide for um, in front of you know the great and the good that were interviewing me, and the service um, our, our, our our general manager, I could see his jaw dropping. <laughs> so I, I got the job on that. I think. Well, Verity, and on that note, I think it's a perfect moment to think about yeah. ending. It's a, it's been a, a really good uh, evening session. And um, I'd like to thank you very much indeed for giving up your time preparing what was an awesome lecture and some really good cases to discuss there. So um, thank you very much. So guys, hopefully there you, you've picked up an, an awful lot of information in that, both about the management of the hot foot and that importance of draining it urgently if you can, if you're worried about the septic patient, um, watching out for ulcers and management of ulcers and offloading them um, in order to try and get healing investigation and, and working out to think where is that kind of red, amber and green zone for often infection related management. Uh, we touched on Charcot as well. There's been other lectures on that too, but also about the principles of total contact casting and offloading in that as well. So hopefully you had a, a enjoyable evening there. And um, what it leads me to do is just remind you that in a moment, the QR feedback will come up on the screen. So take a picture to get that. The code for your feedback and therefore your um, uh, um, certificates is sitting in the chat function right now. So if you want to go uh, get that code, then when you leave the webinar, um, you'll be able to pick that up and it will take you automatically through to feedback and to your certificates. Um, so finally, just me leave you that once again, uh, Miss Verity Carroll for giving up the time and speaking this evening and wish you all a very good evening. Good night. My name is Andy Jones. I'm the CEO of Ramsey here in the UK. Ramsey Healthcare is a global provider of healthcare. We operate in 11 countries, employing 77,000 staff. And incredibly, we look after over 8 million patients a year. Ramsey Healthcare has been here in the UK for the last 12 years. We've now become the number one provider for NHS services, which means that GPs are able to choose Ramsey hospitals to refer their patients for high quality healthcare. So Ramsey has got a long-standing set of values called the Ramsey Way. They really define who we are as an organisation, how we work together, how we look after patients, and ultimately it's all about people caring for people. We're very proud of the services that we provide, and that's largely due to teamwork and our staff. The difference that this makes for patients is really high quality healthcare in all of our hospitals and facilities. We've got an absolutely fantastic programme called Speaking Up for Safety. It's all about training staff to be positive and to call out episodes in patients' care, particularly when they're concerned that things aren't going right. We've been able to grab this programme and we're the first organisation in the UK to roll this programme out. The future for Ramsey Healthcare is bright both globally and for us here in the UK. All of our units are accredited for endoscopy. The Care Quality Commission has rated 92% of our hospitals as good and 95% of our patients would recommend us to their friends and family. We're a leader in day case surgery. We've looked at the way that our hospitals are designed so that we can treat ever more patients in today's healthcare. The future of healthcare is all about partnerships and integrating the patient journey. At Ramsey, this means we need to be working very closely with all our partners, including the NHS, to make sure that our services are available in all the communities that our hospitals serve. Over time, I can see the company both growing and expanding in the reach of its services. But for me, most of all, patient safety and quality come first. Simply put, people caring for people. <laughs>